open my video. There we go. All right. Well, hi everyone. My name is Eric Wolf and I serve as the Executive Director of the World Food Travel Association and I am delighted to welcome you to Food Trucks Global, the Online Food Travel Summit. Today is April 17, 2019 and uh, we are really excited to be bringing to you 10 fantastic talks over the next two days, uh, everything having to do with food and beverage tourism. Today is focused on businesses and entrepreneurs. Tomorrow is focused on destination markets and governments, but anyone from any sector can find valuable content in and around both days. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to just point out a couple housekeeping items for everyone. Uh, if we do happen to have a weak internet connection or you lose yours or your Wi-Fi cuts out, don't worry, you can either dial back in or you can listen to the recording later. And if you would like to post anything on social media, please use Food Trucks Online as the hashtag and also Food Travel, Culinary Tourism and Gastronomy Tourism if you are so inclined. And if you have any questions about the schedule, please just have a look at the Excel sheet that we sent out or on the conference website. And before we get started, uh, I'd just like to remind you of some of the upcoming uh, events. This will also be in the top takeaways handout that we send out next week, but there are quite a few things coming up this year uh, that you will want to keep an eye on, uh, things that are uh, probably going to be of interest to you in food and beverage tourism, things like World Travel Market taking place in November, our Food Trucks London event, and some other things. So don't worry about having to copy down all the dates. We will uh, send that out to you next. Now, uh, let's go ahead and get started with session one, what matters in food tourism today. And uh, this is a little strange because I'm actually the one doing the presenting, so I can't really introduce myself, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I started the food tourism industry uh, back in 2001. I wrote a white paper called Culinary Tourism, the Hidden Harvest. And that white paper gave birth to our association two years later in 2003. And since then, we've grown the association to uh, a, a position today where we serve uh, just over 100,000 people around the world, 100,000 professionals in 139 countries around the world each year. Those are people who are hearing our seminars, they're hearing us talk, they're purchasing our products, they're reading our newsletters, they're visiting our websites and engaging with us in social media. So as you can see, we really have quite a large voice in our industry. And I'm very privileged to be able to uh, be the person who started this and also continuing it into today. So let's go ahead without further ado and talk about what matters in food tourism today. Okay. Oh, that's not the right slide. Hold on. Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. I was not sharing the right screen. There we go. Okay, much better. All right. So first thing that we'll be looking at today is the current state of food and beverage tourism industry. Then we'll be looking at food and beverage tourism issues and solutions. And then we're going to wrap up and have some questions from you. So uh, make sure to have a note of all your questions and you'll be sending your questions into the chat window. And the chat window is located in the control bar at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Any questions about that or anything else that's going on in the sessions, you can type your questions in there. And Jane is in the background and she'll make sure to uh, take care of your needs. So uh, this is not an entry level uh, class or seminar on food tourism. So there are certain assumptions that we have made uh, as we get started today. The first assumption is that you already know what food tourism is and the differences between food tourism, culinary tourism, gastronomy tourism, wine tourism, all, all of those tourisms, uh, that you already know who food loving travelers are, that you understand the benefits of food tourism, and that you also understand how all of these sectors are interrelated. Now we assume that you know those things. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to look at the current state of food and beverage tourism first. Now, this seminar today is based on evidence that came out of the 2019 State of the Food Travel Industry Report that we published in January of this year. And this was a revamp of a previous version of this report that we had done, and we wanted to do more for our industry. So we created this report, which is really a bellwether of what's going on in food and beverage tourism around the world. We invited 70 VIPs 
who are experts in their industries in food and beverage, uh, travel and hospitality, as well as some journalists and academic researchers to contribute to this report. And it's just over 50 pages. It's available for a free download. But the things that we're going to talk about today, we're going to expand on some of those things that were covered in the report. So one of the things that came out of that report is how essential authenticity is. Absolutely, you have to get authenticity right, whether it's in a product that you are creating or an experience that you're delivering. Visitors today know more than they ever have known in the past, and so you can't fool them. And you you just you really just need to deliver the real thing, but at the same time, to be true to authenticity, how do you handle things like innovation and cuisine? Because cuisine is a manifestation of culture. So cultures evolve all the time. Look at song, look at dance, look at humor as examples of culture. Cuisine does the same thing. I was in a, uh, a seminar last year, sorry, a conference last year. Uh, Food Trucks Thessaloniki and speaker John Mulcahy from Ireland was talking about how cuisines change every 50 to 70 years, years the cuisine completely transforms, which is very interesting. But that's maybe not always the case, but at least there are some significant changes over that period of time. Here we have a lovely plate of paella. And it's no secret that the passengers on the cruise ships uh, that arrive in Barcelona disembark and they go on a hunt in the town for the best paella in Barcelona. And that's really a little misleading to them because paella actually originates in, in the area of Valencia, which is about a three hour drive south of Barcelona. So it's a shame that all of these people are coming to what they think is an authentic paella uh, town or, or looking for an authentic paella experience. And I'm sure there are some good ones, but it's not where paella originated. So that is something that, you know, is it authentic? Even if it's, it's still Spanish, it's still being served in Spain, but it's not served in the area where it originated from. So that's a question you have to ask yourselves. Now, we have a, a lovely talk from Conchetta Dema, who's going to be talking about setting the tone for food-loving travelers' experiences, and she's going to be talking about this idea of authenticity. Now, her perspective is from hotels and breakfasts, and she'll be talking a little bit later today. Now, globalization is on the march, and it is threatening cuisine. Cuisine is a manifestation of culture, like we said, so it's everything that has to do with music, sport, uh, humor, art, all of those are also manifestations of cuisine. And when we talk about culinary culture, what we mean are the recipes, the utensils, the cooking methods, the um, table customs, stories told around the table, uh, as well as national holidays, food and drink that are consumed on those holidays, and also the differences between national national and regional food and drink. And what's happening is uh, cuisines are starting to become homogenized. There is a, a diversity of experience that's being threatened. And there's also a threat to choice when you start seeing the same types of businesses popping up everywhere. And also when multinational corporations come in, the most of the earnings, us uh, in many cases, 75% of the earnings they, they bring in are exported, which means they leave very little economic contribution back into the local economy. Now, we have an expert who's going to be talking about this uh, later today as well, Carlos Murray, who is the winemaker at a very old winery in Catalonia. And this winery has to stay competitive, but they also have to stay true to the roots. And so Carlos is going to be explaining what that winery is doing to do just that. Now, you also see the phenomena of whitewashing local. And what does the word local really mean. It's something that's being really overused a lot, just like sustainable is. Does, I mean, give me a, a quick def, definition of sustainable. Give me a quick definition of local. It means many different things to many different people. When you say local, do you mean within a 10 kilometer radius? Do you mean within a 100 kilometer radius? Perhaps you are measuring things by time driven as opposed to mileage or distance. So it is really, um, it's really kind of a, a difficult phrase to use. And I would just say that when you do use the, the term local in any of your marketing, define it. Don't just say it because it's the trendy thing to use. Define what you mean. All of uh, the produce served on our menu comes from within a 20 kilometer radius or all of the produce ser served in uh, the restaurants in our hotel 
uh, originated within a one hour drive of our establishment. Fantastic. Now we know what you mean and who you're supporting. You also do see these larger national and international chains starting to replicate the local experience where they're buying local products too. And they're using um, things on their menus that make it look like they're really doing a great thing. And yes, it is having a, a nice contribution, but what happens is visitors will see the, the shiny new restaurant with the pretty menus and the lovely comfortable looking seating and decide to go in perhaps unknowingly that it's a an international chain that they're visiting so got to think about that and what what are we going to do about that now what we're also noticing is that residents are losing their culinary knowledge as well. Here you have an example of one of the causes, which is uh, grocery stores, takeaways, where people can just pop in, get a quick sandwich or salad or a cup of soup and be on their way. It means that people aren't cooking anymore. And it's a shame, but it's happening. And when people aren't doing that, uh, they're just popping into these types of businesses. It means uh, sometimes local businesses are closing. It also means destinations start to resemble one another where you see th these types of, of um, refrigeration cases everywhere in the world now. So if they all look the same, you know, what <laughs> they're probably selling a lot of the same stuff as well. Uh, but locals are forgetting recipes. They're forgetting how to cook. They're forgetting what traditional dishes are. They are forgetting what iconic products are. They are forgetting culinary traditions and native ingredients. And when those things are forgotten, then that destination looks like every other destination in the world. And in that uniqueness of a destination or the uniqueness of your business, that is the reason why people will travel. If there's no uniqueness, there's no need to travel. So some of the solutions are obviously taking steps to protect the, the local heritage and so on and spotlight the local food and drink. Um, really working with the local residents to teach them how food and beverage, uh, the culture can really drive economic development. And in many cases, some of these artisanal producers, the, the people who are working in their kitchens or their garages or working out of a friend's restaurant, they are developing products that could actually go to export one day. And maybe when we say export, maybe it's just at a regional level to start with, but still that is what we're talking about. Uh, but I would also urge uh, you as your business or uh, even the tourism office to look at local residents as a target market. So many, um, many restaurant owners will look at um, visitors as they come once and they go away and, and they don't really need to market to them. Okay, so who are you going to market to? Market to the locals, but help them to understand, educate the locals. And this isn't just restaurants we're talking about. We're talking about food tours. We're talking about hotels. We're talking about culinary retail stores, all of those different business types, which we'll go into more shortly. Now, we're not the only ones who noticed this issue in our report. You have Joan Roca from El Soler de Can Roca in Girona, Spain, and he recently published a book called Cocina Madre. And in this book, he celebrates the recipes and traditions from our mothers, the thing, very things that we are forgetting today. And it has been highly acclaimed in the press, and it's the kind of thing that is, that is doing, it's making a fantastic statement. It is making progress. It is showing people that this is something worth preserving. And, you know, he's not the only one that is on this march. We also have Mother's Bistro located in Portland, Oregon, uh, in the northwest of the United States. And the chef owner there, Lisa Schroeder, has exactly the same approach, where every month she features a different mother, a real mother, which a she redoes the menu and she has the photo of the mother on the menu. And she uses that mother's recipes and she always focuses on different cultures. So she's had Hungarian, she's had, uh, she hasn't had Welsh, she's had Irish, she's had Italian, she's had Chinese, she's had Jewish. She's had a, a lot of different influences on her menu over the years. So you can imagine 12 different mothers each year. She's been in business for a long time that's a lot of mothers to feature. But what she does is celebrate that tradition. And that's, that's one of the reasons her restaurant is one of the most popular restaurants in the city of Portland. So small businesses are definitely at risk. And what do we mean when we say small businesses? Well, we've uh, divided them into these groups. So we've got the food and beverage businesses on the left. We've got the travel and hospitality businesses on the right and different related businesses at the bottom. And, you know, it's 
it's the obvious ones that you you and we all know what they are, but it's also things like the retail and grocery, which sometimes we forget about, or catering, or meetings and conventions can have a big influence as well, or even professional services. The graphic designer who's designing the packaging that goes on your food or drink product that people see in the store window. All of these people have some kind of influence or impact on the food and beverage tourism industry. But these are just words on the screen. So let's make this a little more real. So if we don't support small and local businesses like yours, then cheese shops like this will go away. Bakeries with fantastic fresh bakery products like this will go away. Chocolate shops like this will go away. Wine stores like this will go away. And when I'm saying going away, I don't mean that all wine stores will close. I mean that the wines might be sold by a multinational grocery store, for example. Ice cream stores or gelaterias like this will go away. Food tours may go away or be diminished. And markets like this may go away. So when you start seeing some of your favorite businesses as the faces behind the words on the screen, then it starts to become more real. And as business owners, you definitely understand what we're talking about here. Your favorite cafe could go away and your favorite restaurant could go away. Now, let's look at some of the um, issues that we see and solutions for those issues in food and beverage tourism. First thing is that visitor expectations are either not being met or they're being poorly met. And here, that's why you have reviews like this on TripAdvisor where people are unhappy. And, and this, is, this is real time. You know, Someone can be in your restaurant writing a really negative review before the foods even come to the table. You know, the, the uh, wait staff was really surly with me. The hostess was, was angry. We had to wait for, for someone to come to our table. That's being posted in real time and that's, that's not great. But um, what is causing this? Well, a lot of times uh, we as business owners, we want a quick sale. We think that visitors won't be back and, and they don't matter as much as the local business does. And that's not, not the case because we talk and we share. We also have soaring costs and we know that you need to keep your costs as low as possible. So that is obviously having an effect on the kind of service. If you have to cut some staff, that means service isn't gonna be as good. That means the visitor experience isn't going to be as good. Uh, this can also drive negative word of mouth. And sometimes what we're seeing is that business owners are unaware of the customer journey, which we'll talk about next. But what are the, some of these solutions? Well, I think that it would be a different way to look at these problems is to really look at selling a memory and not a meal. So instead of selling that hotel room or that restaurant meal, you're creating a memory, a positive memory for your visitor or customer. Do some of the customer journey exercises, which you'll see next. And, and by all means, do take uh, screenshots of what you see on the screen. If you see something that, that you'd like to preserve for later, we won't be able to put everything in the top takeaways handout. So go ahead and, and um, like when on the customer journey slide next, you'll probably want to take a photo of that. And also um, destinations and businesses alike can do experience assessments. And this is a more sophisticated approach than the mystery shopping or secret shopping that you may have heard about. Uh, when we do an experience assessment, the mystery shopping is part of that, but there's also a lot of analysis that goes into it. We look at a competitive set. We have an algorithm and we create a score and that helps the business owner to understand how they're doing, not just then and there when we're at that visit, but also tracking over time. And that's the kind of metrics and data that you need to, to know how you're do doing. And bringing in impartial third-party experts is great because they're not, they, they can see more than, than you or your friends can see. So let's talk about this customer journey or the visitor journey. What does it mean? Well, uh, everything about this is is the entire experience a customer or a visitor has before they buy a product or before they decide to visit a destination. So you have the pre-trip experience, the on-trip and the post-trip. Pre-trip is when the people are thinking uh, about where they might wanna go, what they might wanna do when they get there. They're having conversations with friends, family, and colleagues. They're scouring the internet. They might get some newsletters that they have a look at. They're looking at some of the different websites and looking at reviews of your businesses. This is when they are in thinking and planning mode. 
The next part of this is the on-trip experience. This is the actual reality. This is the experience happening. And the customer or visitor is looking at the overall quality of the experiences that they are having. They're looking at the overall quality of the food and drink. They are solving problems on the spot. So, oh, we can't go there because they're closed today. Or uh, most restaurants are closed in the city on Monday nights. That's actually a thing in some cities. And they're making real-time adjustments. So sometimes people think that they just need to reach travelers when uh, they're in their planning phase, but you also need to be communicating with travelers while they're in your destination. And that's the job of the tourism office. The tourism marketing doesn't stop when the visitor gets there. It needs to continue while the visitor is already there. And then there's the post-trip experience. So this is when we are reflecting on the experience we had at specific businesses like yours in the destination overall. We even, the, the experience we have on the plane home or in the car home or on the train home is part of the overall journey. And we look at everything together. If, if you had a great trip, but your, your plane ride home was an absolute disaster, that tainted the entire trip. And we're writing reviews about these things. We are sharing photos and videos, and we're having discussions with those same friends, family, and colleagues. And all of that information that we're processing goes back into someone else's pre-trip experience. So that is the customer journey, and it is a cycle that continues and continues and continues. So even though those people that you're serving may not be back, but they know hundreds if not thousands of people who might be back and they're influencing them when they're not in your destination. So we have uh, someone who's going to be talking about this customer journey process a little bit later today. Uh, Escarni Falcone, she runs a food tour company in San Sebastian, Spain, and she's going to be talking about a real life example of customer journey and what she does to, um, to handle that. Now, food tourism is definitely more than tourism. It's about uh, a destination starting to look like another destination. It's about main streets starting to look the same across the country. And it's about local businesses closing. And that's economic development or, or economic stagnation if uh, businesses are clothing, closing. So what are some of the solutions to overcome that? Well, involving the local people, they are part of the product. People travel to have interactions with other people. So it is the people working in your business. It is you as a business owner. You are part of what you're selling. It's not the meal necessarily that you're putting on the plate. You could have the best food, but if you're a jerk, you know, no one's going to want to come back to your restaurant or, or your cafe or your winery or your brewery. So uh, you are part of the product. And this notion of protecting local heritage and spotlighting local food and drink, uh, we say that that sounds almost like a general blanket term to cover everything. But what the destination needs to do, and perhaps that's in conjunction with the local government, needs to define what that local culinary heritage is and publicize it. What do we mean by the local culinary heritage in our area? And make that public publicly known. So we know and love and protect and develop these specific products and experiences. That will then help local residents to um, increase their, their community pride. And it will also help to drive product export when more and more people are creating those artisanal food and beverage products. Now, we do have an interesting take on this. We have Donna Karen from New York City and Company, and she's going to be talking about what their destination is doing to differentiate itself with immigrant culinary cultures. So a little bit uh, of a different take on, on local, but still a very interesting and valid one. So she will be speaking tomorrow on that. Now, local and small businesses do need support. And this is something that uh, came out of the research that we did. And what do we mean by support? And sometimes, again, support sounds like something that they, whoever they are, should be doing. But it, this needs to be codified. It needs to be brought together and made clear what kind of support is available. A lot of times you will see cash loans or um, cash grants or loans being made available, but sometimes they're just given out and that can't happen. There needs to be training that goes with any kind of cash or loan because business owners may have been great at what they do 10 or 20 years ago, but things change. Marketing changes, customers change, the way people 
are sold to change it. So they need to have the most current skills to know how to do these things. Um, reduce taxes or changes in tax policy. Now, you might be rolling your eyes and saying, oh yeah, that'll never happen. But when all of the voices of the local business owners come together, change does happen. So voices need to be heard in unison. You need to create a chorus to go to your local government and say, this is the problem. Uh, look, let's look at some zoning issues as well. Uh, you'll see an example in a little bit of a square in a small town in Spain where there's McDonald's. Why did that happen? You know, did the McDonald's need to be in that square? Someone wasn't thinking when they allowed that to happen. And, you know, people aren't going to travel for McDonald's, right? And, you know, I'm not bad, bad mouthing McDonald's. I mean, I, I like their fries. You know, a lot of people like McDonald's. It serves a need and it serves a certain customer base, but it's not part of the local culinary culture. And then, of course, um, that the training, the branding, marketing, exporting, how to sell, those, those are training uh, seminars that small business owners need. You need continually to improve your skill set so you can get better at what you do. Now, uh, no seminar on the state of food and beverage tourism would be complete without the ever-increasing role of social media. And this is also something that uh, the Expert Center report noticed. More and more people than ever are obsessed with food and drink. Everyone eats and drinks. And also video is starting to have an important role in the marketing of food and drink. Now, some of the problems that we see or the experts saw in, in social media are a lot of low-quality posts by consumers, uh, a lot of posts will expire quickly, so you might have just an hour to capture someone's attention, and then it goes away forever. And you can have a glowing review, but it won't be there. Well, we should qualify that. It will be there, but, but people won't find it ever again after that hour expires. A lot of fake reviews and fake profiles out there, people who don't want to stand behind their real name when they have an experience, whether it's positive or negative. And of course, there are there's this whole group of um, people out there, the bloggers, some of whom are absolutely fantastic and very talented, uh, others, not so much. And unfortunately, it's a case of one apple spoils the, the bunch sometimes when people talk about, oh, those bloggers. Well, no, that's, let's qualify this. Bloggers are not, you can't look at them as a whole group. You have to look at them individually. Some are not great. Some are absolutely fantastic. And you work with the ones who are fantastic, of course. So those are some of the problems. But uh, what are some of the solutions to help you in social media? Well, invest in some really good quality photos and videos. And you don't have to spend the world to, to get these quality photos and videos. You could even have contests or you could pay uh, a freelancer a few hundred euros, dollars or pounds to get this done. But stop selling and start telling. Use storytelling, focus on the heroes, focus on you, focus on your chef, focus on the business owner, focus on uh, a waiter. These are the people who have stories, they're characters. And so when a journalist, say for the New York Times, wants to write a story, they're looking for a character. They're looking for something, someone who's a little quirky, a little different. Maybe they're really angry or maybe they're really creative or maybe they look crazy or whatever it is, but that's the character and that's what you need to tell the story about. And then also, uh, this came out of our Food Trucks London conference last year. We had a speaker, Amber Hoffman, who is an expert in social media, and she was talking about how people really don't use Pinterest interest anymore, but it is actually being used a lot by consumers. And the thing about the pins on Pinterest is that they live there forever and people will see them forever. They're findable later, whereas posts on Facebook aren't, Instagram not so much. You have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. But Pinterest is actually a underused and highly valuable tool. So perhaps revisit that. We do have Shonette Laffey, who works for, she works as a social media manager, and she does a lot of work with uh, Visit Bristol in England, and she'll be talking about uh, what destinations need to be doing differently with social media tomorrow. So marketing outreach is also too broad. Uh, being everything to everyone is not a motivator. So if your cafe has nachos and you have uh, Japanese udon noodle soup and you have sandwiches and you have quiche and you have pasta, this is everything. Okay, people do like choice. I, I get that. But it's not the kind of thing, you, if you market that you have all this choice, that's not what's going to excite the traveler, the food-loving traveler. We want to come to 
the business that's known for having the best quiche in the region or the best soup in the region or the best bread in the region. That's what we're looking for. And also food lovers are not all the same. And sometimes people look at food lovers as, you know, all foodies, you are all food loving people. And we, what it qualifies, some people hate the term foodie, first of all. And um, what qualifies as um, food to some people is not to others. Some people are gourmet, other people are driven by farm and farm fresh, it's, it's very different. So what are some of the solutions? Well, focus exactly on what you do well. And for destinations, I would say to focus on one thing, like maybe your, your city is really well known for gin, okay. Focus on that and do that extremely well. And then also for both business owners and destinations, you could be looking at psychoculinary profiling, which is something that we developed within our association about 10 years ago to really help you to fine tune marketing messages. Now we do have uh, Mike McLeod, who's gonna be talking about food sport. And this is something that is a tool that destinations can use to grow. Uh, but it's also something that business owners like you can potentially participate in and also to make sure to tell your tourism offices that this exists. And he'll be talking about this phenomenon tomorrow. So with the march towards getting everything online, um, people seem to be buying a lot on Amazon. And, and I understand, you know, convenience, selection, price, whatever. But the sense of place cannot be purchased online. You can't purchase everything online. And this is the square that I talked about, a small town in Spain, where there's McDonald's kind of tainting that sense of place a little bit. So we travel for a taste of place in order to get a sense of place. And why do we even go to a cafe like the ones pictured here? Or why do we sit there and linger over a long meal, the, the sobre mesa in Spain? Or uh, I've had this experience in Greece as well, where dinner is over and you sit there for two or three hours talking and drinking and talking and talking, right? It's because that is the sense of place. That is the experience itself. And that can't be purchased online. Now, I will be talking about developing a sustainable gastronomic tourism destination marketing uh, uh, tomorrow. And this is uh, oriented a little bit more towards the tourism offices naturally. Now, packaging waste is also an issue, and this is something that um, perhaps you may not have necessarily thought of, but it's definitely an issue that affects visitation. So look here, these are some pictures. This is the Dead Sea in Jordan, and all of the trash that we saw here at the Dead Sea was food and beverage packaging waste. More, bottles, candy bar wrappers, potato chip wrappers, plastic cups, plastic water bottles. Here we have black plastic bags that have been flying in the wind and have been ca caught by uh, the barbed wire fence and they're they're seen throughout the country and it's shocking and it means that we're more concerned about the trash than the actual tourism experience itself it's so disconcerting so this needs to be tackled and it means that our expectations are not being met it needs to be solved by planners and it needs to be a discourse it needs to be um, talked about involving the community, the business owners. Okay, so if you have to use more sustainable packaging, is there an extra cost for that? Or maybe sustainable packaging is not available where you are. Why is that? And work to solve it. We do have uh, Chantal Cook, who will be speaking uh, next today about the undeniable value of social responsibility in food tourism. She's a fantastic, uh, highly engaging speaker, really intelligent woman, and you're going to really enjoy her talk later. Uh, so over tourism is another issue as well, and it threatens authenticity, it diminishes the customer experience, and it also means that um, prices are soaring. So uh, it is something that needs to be uh, handled for sure, not something necessarily that you as a business owner uh, can, can handle on your own. But it means that locals are going to be stop shopping in your neighborhoods and it changes the the landscape of a destination so i would suggest to focus on quality over than quantity uh, getting people out into different neighborhoods in a city that's something that visitors really like to do is to get out and and see where the locals are and get away from the the popular uh, tourist areas we do have olivia duff who's going to be speaking tomorrow about attracting um, food uh, loving visitors into more rural areas and she's located about 30 to 45 minutes outside of Dublin, Ireland and she has a very interesting perspective that you might uh, find valuable. So with that uh, I would like to um, finish up this particular seminar. That is the, the 
you know, lion's share of the content that I wanted to share with you today. I'm just going to put this uh, reminder uh, slide up there with some of the dates, but this is the time for questions. So we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear uh, what else would you like to talk about? Anything in you want to know about in greater detail? Something that wasn't quite clear to you? This is the time to ask questions. Okay, we have a question coming in. And let's see. Oh, it was just a comment. Okay. Perhaps it's a problem that you're experiencing in your own business, uh, something that, that you, a question that you need answered. We're here to help. Okay, here's a question. Can we expand on what psychoculinary profiling is? Yes, absolutely. Psychoculinary profiling is uh, a tool that we developed in our association. It first premiered with our 2010 global research study, and it's been refined in each subsequent research after that, so 2013 and 2016. So it's really a refined algorithm. It's basically uh, a way that we developed that looks at how people make food purchases. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can go to a web browser here and pull up psychoculinary profiling uh, on our website. And you can see what I mean by this. But there's basically 13 different categories of psychoculinary profiling, everything from ambiance to gourmet to social to novice. And so here's where it is on our website. It's under the intelligence tab. And you just go down there to psychoculinary profiling, and that will tell you a little bit more about it. But it's it's a way to to look at how people make food purchase decisions, and you use it to, to in your targeting basically. So one of the the metrics is trendy, another one is local, another one is organic, another one is vegetarian, and this is how you segment food loving travelers even more precisely. So I said there was 13 different types of of profiles and they're located uh, right here so you can go in and, and just have a look at that it's not too hard to figure out what we mean by some of these things you know ambiance obviously the the setting is more important than necessarily maybe or perhaps the food in, in some cases but uh it helps you to segment even more precisely so for example if you're destination is known to be loved by vegetarians and vegans, well, maybe that's something that you want to think about in your own marketing. And maybe that's something that could help you to reach more travelers, uh, to have perhaps an all ve vegetarian or vegan menu, just as an example. But that's what we mean by cycle culinary profiling. It can be used at both the business level as well as the destination level. So we did a uh, food tourism destination strategy last year and the destination chose to uh, look at psychoculinary profiling to help it fine tune its targeting of food lovers to that area. So it wasn't that they should be reaching out to Spanish and Scandinavians and Germans, but it was who, which subgroups of those Germans or Scandinavians should they be targeting and help them to make that decision. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions here. Ask your hard business questions. Is there something that you as a business owner want to know about? Any trends in food and beverage tourism that could be affecting you? I'll go back here and you can see some of the slides that we talked about. And it might spark some some thoughts for you. Here's a question. Do we think that global regional tool for promoting local food offer is needed on the basis of UNESCO list or PDO product designation? Uh, OK, so I think I understand what you're asking here. Basically, uh, is it necessary to have some kind of a designation like uh, protected origin in order to to market a product or a destination? And uh, there's this this is a very complex question. Uh, there are 
there's a lot of ways to look at this. There are certain products that, uh, that things like um, champagne in France or uh, Parmesan cheese in Italy that are protected products. And uh, many of the European countries have a protected products list. Many other countries don't. And I do think that the, uh, one of the problems with this kind of list is that visitors don't know what these designations are. So you use things like DOP, IGP, uh, or PDO, like you used in your question. People don't know what that means. It's just another acronym to them. So what I would suggest instead would be to use a marketing um, phrase. Like uh, Italy could use something like uh, Gusto di Italia or something like that. Or, you know, Taste of Poland. Uh, something that, that means a little more, you know, Taste of Poland certified, right? Uh, something that, that means something to a visitor. I do think that kind of certification can help drive visitor uh, visitors to come to a destination. It can also help them to choose a product to purchase. So I, I, I think it can be a good tool, but it needs to be done right. And, and it can't be these enigmatic, mysterious three-letter codes that people don't use in everyday life. It has to be some kind of a, uh, a marketing campaign with an actual certification behind it. I hope that answered your question. Okay, more questions. And I am just going back and forth on the slides here to maybe prompt something. No? Okay, well, I think that should do it for uh, this particular session. So thank you all very much. We'll wrap up now and do check your Excel spreadsheet. We'll, we will be using a different URL for the next session. And we're doing that because we want to keep the recordings separate. So thank you all very much. And we'll see you in the next uh, seminar shortly.